Hey folks, what's up? I'm back with a vengeance and lots of inappropriate comments to boot. So let's get started on chapter 14, part 1, holes, anatomy, blood. Blood is the only fluid tissue in the human body. Fine, who cares? Uh, it's made up of two parts. Uh, living cells, which we call formed elements. I know, stupid, weird name. And non-living matrix, this is the plasma. So cells and plasma, the liquid. All right, let's take a look. Here you gave a blood donation. Woo! With your big swole arm and your gigantic popping out veins, which you now know maybe why they pop out. Uh, they put them in a tube, they spin it down, and it, the more dense elements, the cells go down below, and the plasma up top. The plasma made up of all kinds of electrolytes and proteins like albumin and fibrinogen for clotting, and various waste products like urea, um, and, and so on. Okay, and then the formed elements, these cells, they're urethrocytes, red blood cells, and leukocytes, the white blood cells. Um, all right. Let's continue. So what about blood? Blood has a range of color. Blood is not blue, people. It is red or a dark red, almost purplish when it's deoxygenated. And even when it's deoxygenated, it's only maybe 50% saturated. Um, it's not all the way deoxygenated or you would be dead. So oxygen rich blood, scarlet red, poor blood is dull red. In general, you see blood, it's exposed to the air, so it always looks scarlet red. It always has to have a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45 or you get uh, acidosis or alkalosis, both uh, damaging and dangerous. You don't want to have that, so pH is important. And you have all kinds of buffers we'll talk about later to help maintain that. Uh, blood temperature as well is slightly higher than body temperature. Uh, runs from your core and carries that temperature all around your body to, to keep you warm. Now let's focus in on the plasma here. Make sure I've got volume on. Uh, it's 90% water, mostly water. Uh, lots of stuff dissolved, okay? Salts like sodium chloride, respiratory gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide are dissolved in, in the plasma as well, nitrogen gas, uh, nutrients, various hormones like growth hormone, for example, uh, proteins, uh, both useful and our uh, transfer info from cell to cell and stuff that you've experienced before, and then waste products like urea, um, CO2, that kind of stuff. The proteins specifically that are found here is albumin, uh, albumin is actually found in the egg whites of chickens, and I do a really good chicken impression. Ready? That's, that's amazing right there. I know. Uh, there's also other proteins like fibrinogen that I mentioned you'll learn later for clotting um, and to help uh, fix damage. And then there's antibodies, which are proteins as well, sometimes called immunoglobulins. Um, they protect from various foreign antigens, as you might imagine. Then the cells themselves, erythrocytes, urethro is red. Uh, so these are the red blood cells, leukocytes, the white blood cells. And then the platelets, which are not cells, they're just parts of cells, they're cell fragments. Let's go through these here briefly. Uh, here you see erythrocytes, about four to six million. Leukocytes, 4,000 to 11,000. So much more numerous uh, are erythrocytes. And then the leukocytes are divided into two categories that we'll touch on here in a second. Granulocytes and agranulocytes. Here we have the granulocytes. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And then the agranulocytes are the lymphocytes uh, and the monocytes here. Uh, and you'll hear us talk about some uh, monocytes in the form, form of uh, macrophages, for example. Uh, and then lastly, you have platelets, which are regularly shaped cell fragments um, for clotting. OK, let's focus on red blood cells. Main function is to carry oxygen. Why do we have red blood cells? To carry oxygen. Specifically, it uses hemoglobin. These are giant fun bags of hemoglobin. Wait, where have I heard that phrase before? Giant fun. Anyways, uh, they're biconcave disks, and they are uh, without nucleus. They're also actually without a lot of organelles because they're just basically carrying sacs or fun bags of oxygen. They carry it around. They outnumber white blood cells quite significantly. Um, all right, and this is what the hemoglobin structure looks like. Uh, hemoglobin has four... Uh, subgroups or smaller proteins that piece together to make one large one, okay? And each smaller protein chain has one heme group. Within that heme group, there is iron, and every heme group binds to one oxygen. This is showing you what a heme group looks like, and here's the iron right in the middle at the core. Oxygen gas is going to be bound to that, so we can bind one, two, three, four molecules of oxygen from one hemoglobin molecule. And you will also note here that there's 250 million hemoglobin molecules in one urethrocyte. That's a ridiculous amount of oxygen carrying capability within one red blood cell. Um, in this case, one hemoglobin carries 
four oxygens, of course. Uh, it bonds, binds strongly but reversibly to oxygen. We will talk about that later. It also happens to bind to um, carbon dioxide and functions in carrying carbon dioxide, although, although that's not the uh, primary way that CO2 is carried in the bloodstream, uh, hemoglobin can. Leukocytes, this is body defense. This is white blood cells and the focus of chapter 16. So we'll just touch on it here briefly with the different cell types. Uh, they are complete cells. They do have a nucleus and various organelles and so on. And one important aspect or function of leukocytes is that they can do diapedesis, which is a complicated way of saying that they can move in and out of blood vessels, specifically the capillaries. They can sneak through the cells that make up the capillary. Here's the walls of a capillary. The white blood cell can sneak through here to get out into the interstitial fluid so that they can attack various pathogens and things that, um, that are attacking the body. Uh, they move by amoeboid motion, right? Everybody do the amoeboid dance. This is how amoebas dance. That's the amoeboid motion. Um, and they also respond to chemicals that damage tissues release um, out into the uh, fluid to recruit more white blood cells, basically. There's normally between 4 and 11,000 cells per millimeter, uh, so not very much, but when you have an infection, those levels rise. Um, if they rise above uh, 11,000, this is, it means that you have an infection. Uh, it's the primary way to determine if there's an, inf uh, an ongoing infection, maybe one that you don't even know of. Um, that's leukocytosis. Leukopenia is an abnormally low leukocyte level, so penia sounds very much like penis to me. Yes, I can say penis because this is anatomy physiology, and it's not that inappropriate. Penia to me sounds like not a uh, substantially large penis, but maybe on the other end, smaller. So uh, it should be easy to remember leukopenia is an abnormally low or small leukocyte level. You'll never forget that now. Certain drugs can cause this, uh, as well as some diseases, like, uh, for example, HIV, uh, active HIV. Uh, okay, types. Types of leukocytes. Granulocytes, they have granules, these little tiny uh, black dots in them that you can see there. I guess here they're being shown as red, whatever. They stain different colors, but you can see those actual dots. We call them granulocytes. The types include neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Okay, and those granules uh, are chemicals that can be released from the cell. Now, the agranulocytes, they don't have cytoplasmic granules. This includes um, the lymphocytes and the monocytes, which we'll talk about uh, a lot as macrophages, but monocytes are kind of the parent cell of those macrophages. Um, so neutrophils specifically have all these fine granules, and they act as phagocytes at sites of infection. You'll learn later how that works, but basically they work, they act like Pac-Man, and they consume and gobble up things, these cells do. And when they do, they may then release these granules out um, as forms of communication and so on. Uh, eosinophils have these large brick red cytoplasmic granules. These are the ones that I showed you as red uh, eosinophils when they're stained. Uh, and these eosinophils work in response to allergies and also parasitic worms. Uh, an aller um, exposure to an allergen causes the release of these granules um, out of the cells. And then basophils are also uh, tied to allergies because these granules are histamine. And when the infection comes, histamine gets released and histamine actually triggers inflammation, uh, and increased blood flow, which makes the area warm and large and, and helps to heal it. Uh, it's the inflammation initiation cells. Then we get the agranulocytes, lymphocytes, which would be the, the majority of the focus in chapter 16. Uh, the nucleus is gigantic. They play a really important role in the immune response in attacking as well as identifying. Um, and then you have monocytes, which are the largest of the white blood cells, um, and they mature into what we call macrophages. So monocytes don't really do a lot of the activity. They become macrophages, which again, like you saw the other phagocytes, they work um, like Pac-Man, and they consume other portions and pieces. And they're really important for fighting chronic infections and for um, uh, pathogen identification. You'll learn all that stuff in more detail in chapter 16. Platelets come from a actual cell that's called a megakaryocyte. And when that cell gets chopped up into pieces, um, we get our platelets, okay? The original megakaryocyte was a multinucleated cell. These platelets are used for clotting. Um, and your normal platelet count is about 300,000. You can't have too much, too little. We'll talk about that in part two. How do we form these cells? Well, it originally occurs in the red bone marrow of long bones. Uh, this is where blood cell formation begins. 
Uh, and they all come from an original stem cell called a hemocytoblast. Remember the blast cells are the original stem cells. Hemo refers to the heme group or blood, and cyto is cell. Um, so essentially you have the hemocytoblast that begins to divide, and one of the cells, after it divides, stays as a hemocytoblast, an original stem cell, and one of them differentiates or becomes a more specific type of cell. Uh, it can then become a lymphocyte or a phagocyte, or, um, as far as the white blood cells go, or a red blood cell. Um, and this chart, if I go back here, maybe here shows the hemocytoblast stem cell, and then it divisions, it goes to lymphoid or myeloid. Lymphoid cells become lymphocytes, and the myeloid cells become all these other cell types. Uh, where am I? Here, yeah, so myeloid stem cell produces other formed elements, the, the red blood cells and so on. What happens when red blood cells get old? Well, they last about three or four months. They don't have a nucleus. They really lack all kinds of organelles, so they can't divide, they can't grow, they can't make stuff, new proteins. They're just there as, once again, oxygen fun bags, and they carry the oxygen around, reversibly binding the oxygen, of course, again. And when they're old and they don't bind oxygen well anymore, they're eliminated, and mostly the spleen does this work, but also the liver helps to eliminate the old red blood cells, and then new ones will get made by uh, the bone marrow. Um, and the lost cells are replaced by division of these hemocytoblasts, not from the red blood cells themselves reproducing, but from the original stem cell reproducing and dividing. Now, how do you know when you need more? Uh, red blood cell production is largely controlled by urethropoietin, which is a hormone produced by the kidney. Uh, its levels increase when oxygen levels are low. So if you go up to Denver and you live in Denver, oxygen levels are lower or it's less available in the atmosphere. So urethropoietin levels get higher and you start to produce excess red blood cells. And this is the basis through negative feedback why some uh, elite athletes, for example, uh, like in the Olympics, they used to train in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and many of the events still do, the non-ball sport events still train in Colorado Springs um, because it helps to boost um, hemoglobin, red blood cell levels, and oxygen carrying capability to then have an improved ability to, um, to be athletic, to run for longer, to run faster, that type of stuff. Um, as a side note, the ball sports don't really exist in Colorado Springs anymore because with less uh, partial pressure, less air pressure from oxygen and CO2 and all that, um, balls actually travel differently or further or faster because there's less resistance caused by those molecules of air. So they, they train those other things at uh, sea level typically. But basically the, hom the homeostasis of oxygen of urethrocyte production uh, is maintained through negative feedback using the hormone urethropoietin, which comes from the kidneys. Here this is showing you that balance. Urethropoietin releases, stimulates the red marrow to produce more RBCs. We have normal levels. If it's too much, we'll shut down levels or, or production of urethropoietin from the kidney. And on that note, we'll stop here and pick it up in part two. Adios.